pleasure to welcome back a graduate of UW-Madison, Dr. Now, Professor Maina Lee, who spent 10 years here in Madison in the History PhD program, taking courses, conducting field research, and completing her dissertation on the political history of Hmong leaders in Laos under French colonial rule. After graduating in 2005, Maina won a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Minnesota, converted that visiting position to a tenure-track post, and with exceptional speed and diligence, fought her way up the academic ladder rung by rung to assistant, then associate, and now full professor of history and American studies. Now, if this were a, a conventional introduction for the usual sort of American academic, such as myself, I would mention something about dissertation done, grants won, languages learned, documents searched, publications published, and well, I guess that would be that. Not too exciting, actually, which is why academics usually write biographies about everyone but themselves, and why academic life generally eludes novelists and film directors alike. But my not Lee, but not my not Lee. Like the survivor of a rugged island trek through tropical storms down trails strewn with mines and across rivers raging with dangerous currents and eddies, Mina is simultaneously living and recording the extraordinary saga of Hmong Americans. Mina was born in a Hmong village in the hills of Zen Quang province, Laos, at a time during the Vietnam War when that tragic region was becoming the second most heavily bombed place on this planet. And as the war swept those hills in the 1960s, her father became an officer in General Vang Cao's CIA Secret Army. And after the communist Patat Lao captured the capital of Vientiane in 1974, her father fought for several years in the resistance, a time of flight, hunger, and unimaginable privation for Minas family. In 1979, Maina trekked through those war-torn highlands for 28 days with her family and crossed the Mekong River's dangerous currents to a refugee camp and safety in Thailand. After less than a decade in America, Maina won admission to Carlton College, one of the, this country's most competitive undergraduate institutions, and there compiled such a distinguished record that she won admission to the doctoral program in history at this university funded by a succession of seven major fellowships. After completing her coursework, Maina faced almost insuperable obstacles from the complex politics of the Hmong diaspora that initially denied her access to Hmong veterans in the United States, a barrier she deftly outflanked uh, with typical verb by traveling to Thailand and France for interviews with elderly Hmong, allowing her to complete her PhD in Southeast Asian history at UW-Madison, thereby becoming the first Hmong American to earn a doctorate in the field of history. In 2015, her monograph, much revised beyond the dissertation, was published by the University of Wisconsin Press under the title Dreams of the Hmong Kingdom, and it was uh, uh, quickly uh, the subject of a succession of glowing reviews. Uh, a quote, innovative contribution to the historiography of Southeast Asia, said the distinguished journal Foreign Affairs. Tells a fascinating story of Hmong leadership in Laos, said the International Journal of Asian Studies. Fascinating analysis of Hmong politics and society significantly enriches scholarly understandings of read the Journal of Vietnamese Studies, and on and on and on. There are many such reviews. This book is the first of three volumes that we'll cover. In its second volume, Bang Pao's Alliance with the American CIA, 1960 to 1975, and then in volume three, The Hmong Chao Fa Resistance and Exile Politics in the United States, 1975 to 2002. <coughs> becoming not just a trilogy, but arguably an epic trilogy that will, I am certain, be much read and like the first book, widely reviewed, marking Maina as one of the leading historians of her generation. Today her talk will take an ambitious, even daring stride across the Cold War's ideological divide to examine the many Hmong and Laos who fought on the other side in a talk titled The Making of Pachai Company and the Hmong Communist Revolution. Maina. Start the time here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor McCoy, for that amazing introduction. I actually haven't read all of the reviews of my book, so it's it's wonderful to actually hear you quote some of these uh, reviews. Um, I should uh, probably be more diligent in quoting, uh, keeping quotes of these reviews uh, on my website. Uh, but thank you again. It's great to be home. Um, 
just one correction to the introduction. I am still only associate professor, not yet full. Okay, one more book uh, to go. Uh, currently, uh, that was a little bit delayed by COVID, of course. Uh, you know, the dean shut down my research funds for several years uh, because of COVID. I picked up uh, the, again, this past uh, fall, past spring to fall, was allowed to use my research funds again. Um, and I'm currently uh, on sabbatical this year and trying to finish the research, uh, hopefully in California. Also, I'm gonna do more interviews here in Wisconsin. Uh, been doing interviews in Minnesota. Uh, and then possibly also France, because I think it's important to return to France. When I was there in 2002, the French have a 50-year policy where <coughs> they only open up to you know uh, 50 years ago. So I think it's opened a little bit more now. Um, after uh, that first stint in France. So I would probably like to return to France also. Uh, and then of course the National Archive and the Vietnam Wars Archive are also still uh, on the list of things to do uh, for the second book on the secret war. But thank you very much uh, for, for that wonderful introduction. It's always good to be home. It's like I never left. You know, I come here, I walk right into the center, talk to Mike, and I'm just like, geez, I never left this place. Uh, it's amazing how much your uh, <coughs> graduate career stays with you as you, some of you will know, okay, in, in 15, 20 years, you'll return, you're like, I never left this place. I, I still dream of this place, you know, walking out basketball, <laughs> or dream or nightmares, or, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it depends, right? All right, so in December after I came back from um, a research stint in North Carolina, I was, uh, it was interesting, I got a call from a women's group uh, in Minnesota, a Hmong women's business group in Minnesota. And as some of you may know, right, all the hype, um, Bai Ying Cha, Cha, which translates as uh, purple, purple poppy, okay, that's her name. Um, and and uh, she, she was the Miss Universe Laos in 2022, and so it's slated to come and compete here in New Orleans. And so she was here, and amazingly, all these more Americans uh, got together, and they started all these fundraisers in Minnesota and Wisconsin, also in California. They wanted to send her to New Orleans, which is interesting, right? Completely forgetting the, that she was on the communist side. So <laughs> there's a point here. Uh, so I came back and then I got a call from these women's group uh, and the call was to, to inquire about, uh, you know, they, they were saying, you know, we're a little bit worried about her political safety um, and we wanna make sure we don't do any harm to her or her family once she returns to Laos. And so uh, they said, well, what happens, we, we organized this gala December 29th there uh, in Bloomington, Minnesota and we then suddenly a Hmong veterans group wanted to come and give a medal to her, okay? And the medal is the Vang Pao Medal of Recognition, right? Um, and then, strangely, not knowing the competitions between Dr. Yang Dao and Vang Pao since 1983, uh, this one women's organization had the idea that, okay, we're gonna have Dr. Ying Dao give the Vang Pao Medal to Pai Ying Chan, right? <laughs> so, so, so you can imagine all these disasters here. Um, and then they called Dr. Ying Dao and I'm told that Dr. Ying Dao says, um, no, right? But he didn't explain why. He just said, nope, I'm not giving that medal to her. So then one of the husbands of the woman said, uh, maybe we should consult somebody about this, right? So they called me and I said, okay, uh, well, let me put it this way. In 1975, after the fall of Laos, uh, the communists sentenced Meng Pao to death. Okay, he's one of the people that was sentenced to death. Now, what do you think about giving his medal to a woman who is an official representative, right? An official ambassador from the La PDR. And they're like, oh, he was sentenced to death? I said, yes. And in fact, in 2009, when Wang Pao, uh, after his arrest, you know, announced that he was gonna return to Laos, immediately the response of the Lao PDR was, yeah, come back and face your death sentence, okay? So, <laughs> so I told them that, and they're like, okay. Maybe we better rethink this, right? And so even, then they had to retract the promise to allow this veterans group to come and give the medal to Bai Yin Cha. And, and you know, I just, we cracked tons of joke about how Bai Yin Cha, if she actually take the medal, we have to discard it before she cross over the Mekong, you know, into Laos. <laughs> so, so it was an interesting uh, incident uh, that occurred. And I think the incident really, you know, really speaks to how the younger generation of Hmong no longer remembers the, the sort of factional dispute in Laos. 
And then the older generation, of course, are still in a lot of pain about it, right? But, you know, what was the motive of this veterans group in wanting to award the Veng Pao Medal to Pai Ying Chang for her accomplishments? Quite provocative. I just can't imagine that they are ignorant of the, you know, the sort of political implications of what they were doing, right? So we can only guess at what they're trying to do, but um, I think they know exactly, you know, the consequences of such an action. So now going back, right, this is why I think this talk, and this is why there's, there needs to be more studies about the Hmong communists on the other side. Uh, so we know that since coming into power, the Lao PDR uh, has started to create these narratives that legitimate their regime. Uh, and one way of uh, legitimating the regime is to broadcast the idea of a victorious, unified, multi-ethnic state where all ethnic, ethnic groups have political equality, which is a contrast to the former royal regime where people like the Hmong were politically marginalized at the margins. And so toward this end, then Oliver Tapp argues that the concept of Kan Su Kusat, or the national liberation struggle narrative, uh, which he says actually does not break uh, radically from the Lao Pass is fundamental to the Communist Party's legitimating discourse. To physically advance the narrative of this united uh, ethnic front from below, beginning in the 1990s, the state then began to publish heroic exploits of their uh, revolutionaries. And among some of them that were early publications was uh, the biographies of Kai Suan, Sopanu Wong, and others. And so capitalizing upon uh, this, the Hmong in 2004, for the first time, uh, especially Tao Tu's family, began to also publicize uh, his uh, exploits in the revolution and, and began to broadcast him as a Hmong revolutionary nationalist hero. So, uh, so, so then finally, uh, in, in terms of the other thing that they also started doing in the 1990s was to uh, build monuments uh, to these revolutionaries. So the Kaiso Museum and a ton of other monuments were built. And finally, uh, the Hmong were included in this monument construction in 2015 uh, when the, the communists then uh, built a monument for Fai Dan Lo De Yao and then also for uh, Du Yang, uh, who is uh, who was during this time popularly known as Mr. Tu or Tao Tu. Uh, and so both of these monuments, one is Tao Tu's monument is located in Phong Savan, and then Fai Dan Long Yang's monument is located today in the uh, town of no, Head. Um, so, of course, you know, Hmong Americans, some of the Hmong Americans, uh, Hmong Americans in America had already gotten congressional recognition officially in 1995, the very first recognition where they awarded three medals, uh, just two groups uh, of Hmong, not individuals, was in 1995. And uh, the Hmong members who actually uh, was able to obtain these kinds of recognition, including those who uh, were able to then build uh, several Vang Pao uh, monuments in Fresno as well as in uh, Chico uh, City, sort of wants to claim, right, that the Lao actually, because they're a couple years behind the Vang Pao monuments, uh, and about maybe almost 20 years behind the 1995 recognition, uh, some of these individuals are claiming that, in fact, you know, what the Lao state is doing is actually in response to what was happening in the U.S., uh, and that they are trying to build a counter-hero argument, you know, for Hmong people on the other side. I don't know if that's the case, okay, but this is what they tell me uh, they think is happening over there. So uh, what I want to do here then is to, uh, to look at the ways in which Tao Tu emerged as a nationalist hero in Laos uh, and to interrogate uh, that situation for us a little bit here today. So scholars note that the communist efforts to construct a multi-ethnic state falls far from the ideal, but by opening the door, for a new narrative of united ethnic front against imperialists, uh, they then opened the door for Hmong people also to proclaim their heroic efforts in the revolution. 
And in 2004, then, Tautu's uh, nephew, Suddala, uh, published for the first time his biography, which uh, he did research among Tautu's comrades and family members uh, to construct this narrative. Now, who was Tautu? Well, Tautu was uh, a man, a man, uh, born in May 1916 uh, in the district of Nong Head, which is the region right on the Vietnamese Lao border. Uh, he was the fifth son of fifth of seven sons of a man named uh, Ya Sai Chu, uh, and the sister of Long Bi Yao. So Ya Sai Chu was married to the sister of Long Bi Yao, and Tao Tu is, is the son of the sister of Long Bi Yao. Who was Long Bi Yao? Long Bi Yao was the Hmong leader in power from 1910 to 1935 during the time of French rule. And from 1946 until his unti untimely death in a car accident in 1961, Tautu emerged as a popular figure on the communist side. Tautu was the revolutionary nationalist leader and former commander of the Patet Lao 2nd Battalion on the Plain of Jars and an extremely important Hmong military commander on the left. Here I will interrogate the construction of Tautu as a dedicated Marxist by his nephew Suddala, and therefore shedding light on Hmong narrative constructions in Laos. But examining the evidence uh, proposed or presented by Suddala, I argue that Tautu's role as a patron and his methods of maintaining clientele is actually quite reminiscent of uh, the efforts of Tubi Lifong and Wang Pao as well on this side. Uh, that is that Tautu himself employed home marriage politics to build his Patai company uh, during this time period. Uh, and this is, this is evident in the, in the biography as well, even though Sudala continually want to push the idea that Tautu was a true Marxist. Okay, we still sort of still see all these traditional elements come out. So, uh, so Tautu then, uh, who was he? Again, his mother was the sister of Lao Ya or Lao Kai Tong, because he was so legendary. That's the title that people, Hmong people uh, know him by. And he was the French sanctioned Hmong leader in the Nonghead San Kuang region in the early 20th century. He was backed by the colonial army. He was a powerful figure who crushed Wu Pachai's anti-colonial revolt in 1920, which is an ironic twist in historical happening since Le Yao's nephew Tao Tu and his son Fai Dan would later emerge as staunch anti-imperialists. So it's it's pretty interesting, right? That um, you know, whereas it, as Le Yao uh, picture here was uh, originally on uh, this sort of the French side. Now in the 1940s, his sons are going to be on the communist side fighting the French. Du Bili Fong's father, who was sort of anti Long Liao during the time, that time period, now is going to emerge on the French side. And so this kind of like switch sides suddenly. Um, and um, so uh, it's, it, it's, if you look at the history, then it's uh, very interesting in the ways that Hmong uh, play their politics. So as a boy, according to uh, Sudala, the uh, biographer of Tao Tu often visited his uncle. And in fact, his uncle, who was uh, a bureaucrat under the French, uh, was instrumental in the ways in which Tao Tu imagined class oppression. It's because as a boy, he would visit his uncle, because his mother was Lovia's uh, sister, uh, and he would see Lots of people bring, you know, money, opium, and things like that to Lobiya, and then he would ask Lobiya, why are all these people bringing you all this stuff? And Lobiya would tell him, well, because they're paying their taxes, right? Um, and then this is what led to his consciousness about class, uh, supposedly, okay, according to Sutala's uh, construction. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, read that whole passage uh, from the biography for the interest of time. Um, so, uh, also the, in the process of, of doing that, uh, you know, Sudala continues, uh, Tao Tu then uh, also, when he keeps going to his uncle's house, would encounter oppression and then would start to understand the failings of the colonial morals 
that left disunity among the Lao people because his uncle, as a French bureaucrat, was forced right, to uh, it, it, sort of the wedge you know, between class oppressions. This realization eventually then drove Tao Tu to take up arms and to rally his own relatives behind the communist revolution. The Kanto Su Pusat narrative is again clearly evident in Tao Tu's actions of defending the oppressed peoples of all ethnicities later on. And of course, lost in this uh, construction, what is retelling is the fact that, in fact, Tao Tu's own relatives, his Yang clan, also fought on the other side with Du Bili Feng as well. Uh, and then later in the 1960s, fought on Zheng Pao's side. So, uh, you know, by, and then when you read the biography, they make it seem like all the Yang clan of Tao Tu's family unilaterally supported right, the communists, but that actually uh, is not true, which I will, will, will uh, demonstrate shortly here. Finally, Toto also joined hands with the Lowland Lao, according to the biography, who aided him in his dreams of liberation, uh, and so therefore forming alliances with, with uh, you know, uh, main communist figures like Supanduvong, Kai Suan, Sitong Komadam, and then ultimately Toto becomes again, you know, one of these nationalist heroes along with these other individuals who were friends in the ethnic struggle against the imperialist. Throughout the biography, Hmong disunity and Lowland Lao prejudice is, of course, conveniently forgotten because it becomes a class struggle, no longer ethnic struggle. Um, and as uh, you know, uh, Tautu's, especially as Tautu's narrative is integrated into the multi-ethnic struggle narrative. If we examine the origins of Tautu's reasons for joining the communists, however, a different historical picture emerges. And so now, Let's turn our attention to examine how Tao Tu got caught on the communist side and the traditional methods that he employed to build his Bajai company and ultimately uh, you know, the, the battalion, the Bajai battalion. Hmong division, of course, dates back, way back uh, to the time of Long Yao, um, to the early part of the 20th century, and I don't have time to go into deep details here. Uh, but I, I sort of, I talked about the divisions in my book, uh, Dreams of the Hmong Kingdom. What happened was that the French, once they uh, got a hold of Laos, wanted to create an umbrella figure for Hmong society uh, in order for, they thought, easier control. Because um, Hmong society was segmented by autonomous clans. And so they thought if they created a one Hmong leader, they could use that leader, therefore, to uh, control everybody. And of course, they, they didn't just do this among the Hmong. They did the same thing with the Thai and the highlands of Vietnam. So. Uh, well, the Elden Trees family up there too. So uh, we can see the same kinds of methods in Hmong society. Uh, and so that then led to actually, I argue in my book, Dreams, that uh, the end of French colonial rule, because when they did that, right, instead of uh, making it easier to rule, what they did was they instigated all these clan divisions and struggles for this paramount position. Uh, and so all these clans emerged uh, to compete for that clan position, and whichever clan that the French didn't give it to went to the other side. You know? So uh, they actually instigated their own demise in the end. Um, and so that's what happened to the Yang clan. The Yang clan now has not been very powerful uh, up, up till this time. Uh, in fact, they didn't emerge very powerfully until the period after World War II with Tao Tu as uh, a military commander. But according to the Yang clan, uh, especially according to uh, Yang Sao, who is a nephew of Tao Du on this side and living in America. He said Yang man, his clan's man, had always been ambitious. And so therefore, they formed marriage alliances with the powerful clans uh, in the society. In this time period, the two powerful clans were the Li and the Lao clans. So they, they married you know, uh, uh, both of women from those clans. And in fact, Yang Sao said, um, the men in my Yang clan always aim to marry in China, or daughters of the leaders. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, his father, Yang Xiao's father, uh, married Du Bin Lifeng's half-sister, right? And then his father's cousin, very close cousin, first cousin, married uh, the uh, sister of Long Li Yang. Okay, so, uh, and of course, uh, that individual was Ya Sai Chu, uh, the father of Tao Du. Uh, now what happened is that these political connections turned out to be a double-edged sword for the Yang clan because it ultimately ended up dividing the Yang clan. When uh, Tubi and Fai Dan split after World War II, 
uh, after the Japanese occupation, the Yangs were pretty much caught in the middle. Uh, and so therefore, both sides started uh, to get enticed by Tubi and Faidan with promises of rewards if they would fall to one side or the other. Uh, Tubi, for example, made Yang Xiao's father the Taseng, uh, Tam Tao, thereby gaining his loyalty. Uh, and and Tautu, meanwhile, had grown up among the Nengjia, or the maternal relatives of Lobliya. So he grew up in close proximity to Lobliya, as, as Sudala says, used to go visit Lobliya, right? his uncle uh, saw all these uh, class oppressions. Uh, and so therefore, naturally, Tautu now is caught on the other side uh, due to that proximity to his maternal uh, relative, Lobliya. And so on the left, Hautu then uh, rose quickly with communist patronage to become the commander of a Hmong militia. When Tubi's men attacked and killed Hautu's Yang relatives after World War II, <coughs> the alliance with Fai Dang was solidified further because now not only was he just caught on that side, but avenging his dead relatives became an incentive for him to draw the Hmong to draw his uh, clan onto that side. Reflecting the complexity of the Hmong division in northeastern Laos, other members of Tautu's family immediately uh, choose to side with Dubi uh, as they were also connected to Dubi. Uh, and of course, these, these family members ended up on Dubi in the Vanko side, and then in the 1975 period, they ended up here in America. Uh, and so one of the members uh, who Paul Hilmer interviewed, uh, whose name was one Chuck Yang, uh, also closely related to Yang Chao Yang, who I just uh, quoted there, uh, told Paul Hilmer why and how their family was split, right? So Wan Chuck said, at the time my grandfather's brother was an officer on the Patet Lao side. My grandfather was on the city council on our side, meaning the Vang Tao side. My grandfather's brother, meaning Tao Du himself, said, Supanuvong and the others gave me the rank of major, and sooner or later I will become a general. So I'm willing to work for them. Half the city of Nohet, all my dad's family went with him to North Vietnam. Right? So again, you know, rewards of title is an incentive uh, for Tao Tu to go onto that side. Now, one Chuck says that his grandfather's younger brother, however, was. Uh, Tubi Levon's brother-in-law and a city official in Nong He. And so, Wancha continues, he said, if you people want to go with my brother Tao Tu, then you go ahead, but we're not going. We want to go with my brother-in-law Tubi Levon. And whoever wants to come with me, come with me. And that's why they split the family, right? So, uh, looking at the ways in Hmong politics, uh, you know, this Yang family now is split because of the way that they had already established marriage ties to Fai Dan's family and to, to Bi Li Fong in the previous era. Uh, so they chose side right, based upon this sort of family connection. Okay. Now, um, while Dubi, Dubi was political leader and military commander on the royalist side, right, so both civilian and military commander, on the other side, interestingly, those two positions were split uh, respectively uh, between so uh, between uh, Tao Tu and, and Fai Dang and his brothers. So Tao Tu on the other side becomes the military commander and then Fai Dang and his younger brother um, became the political or civilian leaders in the Hmong resistance. But as commander of the uh, Plain of Jars, Tao Tu would be somebody with much more power, actually, according to uh, Sudala's biography, uh, than I think Pai Dan could even imagine. Uh, and I think his power was sort of uh, cut short, you know, because he died in 1961. I mean, it would be interesting to see what would have happened had Tao Tu survived that, um, the kinds of power dynamics in Laos. But uh, unfortunately, he dies very early. Uh, so, meanwhile, Tautu was the field commander on the Plain of Jars, tall and dynamic in personality. Tautu became the crucial nexus between the Viet Minh and Sen Kuang, the Viet Minh and the Pate Lao in Sen Kuang. Uh, and he was very successful in the field. Uh, but 
of course, it was Tautu's knack for exploiting traditional alliances uh, that ultimately would lead to his climb in his power. His biography elaborated on his marriage politics with Cadre Saint from Vietnam and uh, also from China, uh, and then also with Hmong, other Hmong clan members uh, in San Quan. Marriage alliances served as recruitment foundation for the Bacchai company, in fact, allowing his family to retain their high status in Lao society today. During the first Indochina War from 1946 to 1954, members of the Bacchai company led by the Viet Minh and led the Viet Minh in attacks along Colonial Route 7 in Laos all the way to Sin Quan Town and helped them make incursions north into Samnia as far and then south as far as the town of Tavian just north of Vientiane. As they dominated, um, demonstrated their valor in the field, more recruits joined Pachai's company. So as Tau uh, you know, demonstrated his, his valor in the battles, he was able to convince more and more Hmong to come onto the fold of the Pachai company. Uh, again, Pachai company named for the uh, anti-French uh, hero, Lu Pachai. Uh, so according to Sudala uh, in the biography, he states, wherever Tu, Yang, tu Yang's relatives attacked the enemy, they were successful, making him known to the citizens of Sing Kwan as the swallow bird of Mwenpun, okay, Mwenpun, Mwenpun. Because of his success, other troops led by other leaders also agreed to merge their uh, troops under Tatu's company as well. So. Uh, in this way, therefore, he was able to increase the number of Bajai's company. Totu also gained recognition by the communists. In October 1946, the Bajai company was incorporated into the armed forces of the Lao Isara, being the first company that had originated in San Kuang. So again, you know, highlighting how instrumental the Hmong were in this region of San Kuang. Uh, where the Hmong actually has a very large number. So it's not only on the Leng Pao side that the Hmong uh, were instrumental, but also on the communist side. Later, uh, Tautu's Pachai company was incorporated as the fifth company of the second battalion of the Patet Lao Revolutionary Army. Uh, evident of his important role in 1958, Tautu as leader of this officially sanctioned hero company was promoted to the rank of colonel and given command of the Patet Lao second battalion located on the plain of Jars. He was the very first Hmong to achieve the rank of colonel, having been promoted by the communists before Vang Pao obtained the same honor on the Rolau side, with pressure, of course, from the American CIA. So uh, actually, he gained incredible recognition uh, on that side. And we can understand why he went to that side, uh, because of the inducements of rewards. Despite portraying Tautu as a Marxist Leninist revolutionary, Sudala dwells into a long narrative throughout the rest of the biography that highlights Tautu's political approach, which by all appearances remains traditionally embedded within the confines of Hmong society. The traditional elements, however, were ingeniously crafted into the communist claim to a higher morality and tagged onto the multi-ethnic narrative struggle. <coughs> Like his Hmong opponents on the right, Tautu calculatingly exploited uh, the women of his family to forge political alliances. Uh, two sisters uh, in, in Mao were forced to marry, uh, respectively, a man named Lao Lu, a political cadre from China. And also one was uh, you know, told by Tautu to marry Viet Song Hung, who was sent by Ho Chi Minh to be the communist liaison in Xian Kuang. Hong's marriage to Mao was particularly notable in view of strict communist uh, disciplinary practices, according to Long Tzu. Long Tzu uh, is the nephew of, of Faidan Long Riyo, the, the Hmong leader on the other side, the political Hmong leader. Long Tzu told me uh, when I, I visited him in 2008, he said, Ho Chi Minh strictly forbids cadres from Fraternizing with the local population. Fraternization was punishable by death, but this marriage was allowed to go forward. So Hong, uh, after the marriage, became af actually fluent in the Hmong language. Uh, in his death, uh, is buried as a nationalist uh, hero next to Tautu, and Tautu's family plot in Hong and you see 
the three grave sites here, Tokdu, Hong, and then his uh, nephew, Pasut, all of them, you know, Pasut later also commanded the Pachai, after Tokdu died, he was the commander of the Pachai company as well. Uh, and so that close alliance, therefore, served to bolster uh, Tautu's position uh, as well as to draw Hmong people onto the Vietnamese side. Similarly, uh, Tautu's niece, uh, Sia Yang, was ordered to marry a man named uh, Chu Tan Noi, who was a soldier of the Bacai Company, uh, according to Su Da, in quotes here, in order to keep morale high. Right? So, you know, he's also just telling his nieces and, and his sisters and you know to just just marry whoever arrange all these marriages uh, in order to give you know uh, them rewards and to entice them to join a giant company financial patronage notable in traditional monks in Lao society was also important for Tautu's legitimation Tautu used his family's material riches and his family was one of the richest by the way uh, in in the Long head region uh, he used that wealth to obtain the loyalty of followers, very much like Tu Bili Fong too, because he was also very wealthy, so he used his family's wealth to also uh, obtain patronage, uh, or following a clientele. According to Suddala, uh, Totu assumed a parental responsibility and transcended clan, clan lines by paying the bright prices for soldiers under his command. So you can see, you know, among, among women, bright prices is very costly. You can see uh, how patronage then was crucial for drawing, in fact, individual soldiers uh, from poor Hmong uh, families onto his side as well. A final method of rallying support is, of course, the bestowing of titles, uh, which is reminiscent of that employed by Tu Bili Fong during the time of the French, and then exploited even more effectively uh, after the 1960s by Wang Pao. You know, the bestowing of both civilian and military titles. This is something that Tautu also did on that side. Like his opponents, Tautu was empowered by the Pathet Lao with the ability to hand out military and civilian titles. Uh, promotions were strategically calculated to attract recruits into his militia. In some cases, he combined a marriage alliance with a promotion, binding the person to, you know, doubly uh, to, as, a, as an ally to him. Um, and so he was very, very uh, strategic and very, very good at doing, uh, employing these kinds of marriage alliances. Uh, and uh, Suddala, for example, says in, in the biography, he said, Tu Yang arranged marriages between his family and brother soldiers from different regions. His niece, uh, Yua uh, Zhuaya, a daughter of his eldest brother, was married to Pakaolo with no charge. So in other words, you know, if it's his own family members, he just cancels the bride price. And then, of course, we already said he paid the bright price for other soldiers, too. So uh, this is another method. Uh, and then uh, not only does he uh, bestow favor upon the father, Pakolo, but um, this favoritism then extended to uh, Pakolo's son, uh, who, uh, whose name was Yakua. Uh, and eventually, Yakua, because of the connection to Tautu and his power, uh, was able to train as the very first Hmong Mig fighter pilot in the Lao PDR, right? So um, sort of Hmong pilots are, are sort of very prestigious in Hmong society on both sides. Um, but but Hmong did not, the Hmong on this side never flew MiGs, okay? They flew T-28 only, so MiGs are like jets. So Tuya also promoted others such as uh, Muen Yenu and Lao Na Tu, both of whom commanded Batai Company in succession. Uh, and then he enticed other commanders to join Batai Company by awarding them military ranks. So Sudala writes, uh, Duya convinced uh, Nien Nu Tao's company, which fought the French in Tam Tao in 1946, to join Batai Company by promoting Nien Nu to the rank of a company commander. So again, the ability that was bestowed upon him by the communists to actually pass titles right, was essential in attracting people to his Batai uh, company ultimately, you know, Batai Battalion. Uh, and then, of course, Tautu himself continued to build that alliance upwards, too, because uh, Hmong Man's leadership, as I noted in my book, Dreams, uh, is, is dependent upon legitimation from the state or state authorities. Uh, and so his first alliance was uh, with the uh, cadre Vien Song Hung, uh, but then uh, the biographer also talks about another relationship, another blood oath that he took with a Vietnamese man uh, by the name of uh, Ngo Tae Sun, 
um, and Wotesen's presence seems to be sort of a legitimating uh, element for uh, Totu, and not only for Totu, but also for his children. Uh, because I think scholars like uh, other scholars of Lao society also point out that Vinmi's connection is very important to uh, political climb upward uh, on the communist side. So uh, I think those connections are important, not only for Tautu, but also uh, later on. Uh, and so Tautu continues to climb politically uh, in, in Fainan, helping Fainan also to climb politically. Uh, and then eventually uh, Tautu did the most heroic thing. Uh, the most heroic thing, of course, was um, the 1950, 59 defection to the other side, right? So as, as the Lao were trying to form the coalitions, uh, the first coalition failed, and then in 58, 59, the second coalition, uh, you know, Wang Pao was sent to China and entice Tautu onto uh, the railway side, and Tautu feigned illness, and he refused to integrate his, his, uh, his battalion onto uh, the, the royalist side, and eventually <coughs> one night on the evening, evening of uh, January 13, or the, one evening uh, in 1959, he just, you know, he, he, they pretended to party, they did loud music, um, and Wei Pao thought they were still there, but the next morning, when Wei Pao went to check, they were gone. They had already defected onto the other side. And so by 1960, then, uh, the coalition government had failed in Vientiane, and Tao Tu is back on the plane of stars, <coughs> this time helping Gong Lei's neutralist troops fight uh, those on the Rawlis side, fighting Wang Pao, in fact. Um, and so to bestow then the full, uh, eventually then, however, though, it, it, Hotu's uh, death then ended up, uh, you know, ended his, his heroic efforts. Uh, on January 13, 1961, he was supposedly riding along Colonial Route 7 to a battle site, uh, and he had approached the bridge of uh, Samsung in Sing Kuang. Um, and he was afraid that the bridge was mined, so he told his Vietnamese driver of the jeep to you know, not go on top of the bridge, but to go to the side. Uh, the driver went down, there's this like a little incline. Actually, I actually was at this site when I was in Laos. He went up a little incline, there was a rock there, the jeep hit the rock, and Hmong, Hmong people in this time period, I'm told, are very nervous, so every time when the car seems like they jump off, you know, right? So he jumped off, but he landed behind the jeep. As the jeep hit the rock, it backed and ran over him. And so he died uh, on the site on January 13, 1961, unfortunately. Now, to bestow him the full honor of a revolutionary hero, Ho Chi Minh actually ordered Tatu's body flown to Hanoi for a state ceremony before it was then taken back by car back into Nong Head, uh, where he ultimately <coughs> Uh, was buried um, here um, at his uh, village in Nong Head. So uh, let's move quickly to conclusion, then we can talk, I think, for a little bit. Overall, I think Totu's biography can be viewed within the context of the larger Lao communist attempts to legitimate their new nation state. The message of sacrifice and the formation of a multi-ethnic nation were important narratives that allowed ethnic minorities like the Hmong to proclaim credit for their own participation in the revolution, while at the same time also obscuring painful issues of Hmong division or Hmong killing Hmong. In the biography, the historical divisions of the Hmong that stretch back to the second decade of the 20th century is depicted as the struggle between nationalists and imperialists, right? Not you know, Hmong versus Hmong. As in the creation of a national narrative for Laos, the construction of the blood sacrifice of the Hmong for the revolution involves selective amnesia, therefore. There is no mention of Hmong division. And we do that in this side too, okay? It's not just the Hmong communists. Nevertheless, Sudala successfully proclaims credit for Tao Du and his Yang clan as well as for the Hmong, when he recast Tao Tu as a communist nationalist hero who was aware of the class consciousness from the early age. Closer inspection reveals, however, that Tao Tu was perhaps one of the most, um, one of those people who were merely caught in the dispute between uh, Du Bilifeng and Fai Dan Lo 
and because he was in close proximity to Faidan, ultimately his family suffered uh, casualties, and so that drew him to create Fatai Company. Tautu, however, however he started, we cannot deny that he became a crucial nexus between the Pathé Lao and the Viet Mien. And once he was co-opted into the revolution as a national, nationalist hero, he became the rallying point to draw one-third of the monk onto the side of the communists. His charisma and his spirit as a military leader, his unmatched political skills to form marriage alliances between his own clan members and his oath of brotherhood with Viet Minh cadres, uh, which are quite reminiscent of how his uncle also took lots of oath of loyalty to uh, French administrators in the 1920s, ultimately aided in Tautu's prestige and gave him legitimation to become a Hmong leader on the communist side. Tautu's military and political skills made him a renowned figure that was respected by Hmong and non-Hmong alike, including Hmong on the Van Pao side. So I'm told by Colonel Macaulay from, for example, that when he was killed, during his funeral, Wang Pao suspended the bombing of the Nong Het region to allow Tao Tu's funeral to take place. So clearly he had respect you know, from uh, his opponent. So uh, on February 2015, then, the uh, Lao government uh, finally honored Tao Tu with a monument in, in Pon Savan um, here. Uh, and you know, he, the, the monument, he's dressed in army fatigues with the uh, communist peasant head and a pair of binoculars around his neck. He's standing erect, looking into the horizon, and of course with that right victorious fist uh, into the sky. And Tautu's daughter, uh, Pani, appeared at the opening ceremonies to unveil the statue. Uh, so his memory also uh, legitimates Pani in the communist state. Today, she remains the highest ranking Hmong individual serving in the Lao PDR, being third in power as of 2023. So uh, that legacy uh, of being a hero is now passed on to her now. The question is how long would that last? We don't know, okay. All right, I'll end it here and uh, allow us to have a little bit of discussion if, if possible.